Good to see you, everyone. My name is Robbie Howell. This is my friendly sun-blocking mattress, because it is the middle of the day when I am recording. A little about me. I am a history lover, a tabletop game designer, and a lifelong player of Age of Empires 2. And in this series, Civ Theory Crafting, I take a stab at designing a couple of civilizations that are not yet present in Age of Empires 2, but I think should be. In this episode, I'm going to be going off of a poll that I ran on my community tab a couple weeks back, asking people among a couple of different viewer-suggested builds which one I should do first. And the winner, by a landslide at the time I took this screenshot, was Ahmed Noor's suggestion for the Ayyubids. But if you caught last week's video, you'll know that I'm no longer doing dynastic builds on the channel. For now. Ahmed left me this comment quite a while back on my old Umayyads slash Syrians video. And so, without further ado, allow me to present to you now... The Egyptians. I'm going with a name besides the originally proposed Ayyubids for this particular build. I have a sidebar on that topic I'll get into in a moment, but for now suffice to say that the Egyptians are an archer and elite civilization that is derived from the current Saracens Civ. Among all of my planned changes to the various Islamic dynasties that ruled the early Middle East, the Egyptians are the ones that are most similar to the Saracens as we know them now. If you want to see my normal disclaimers and detailing of my philosophy on how I approach these builds, take a look on the screen right now. And as a reminder, if you ever want to see details on any of the specifics for any of my builds, take a look in the description box where I have a link to a comprehensive civilization doc with all of my listed sources. All that makes sense? Excellent. In that case, let's begin with the Egyptians. A sidebar. The name Egyptians. I considered an awful lot of different names for this building. In fact, I considered seven in total. Now, per dynastic names, as my video last week details, I figured it would be better to stick with the more tried and true ethnic naming system, and so that ruled out half of my ideas. The remaining ones that I had came to were Egyptians, which is what I ended up going with, the Copts, which were the name of the ethnically indigenous, or as indigenous as you can get, Egyptians, though Arabic influence became much more prevalent in Egypt than the Coptic influence ever was very quickly, and so it didn't feel quite right to go with that since this is such an Islam-focused build. Uh, and lastly, the Kurds. My reason for it, even though Kurdistan is obviously quite far away from Egypt, is that uh, Egypt was ruled by Kurds for quite some time, Salah ad-Din being one of the main ones, and his entire Ayyubid dynasty were primarily Kurds in nature. Uh, it just didn't feel right for the entire civilization to be modeled after their rulers, when that was only a small percentage, and wouldn't really make sense for units like villagers, trade carts, and even most foot soldiers. But I have an interesting compromise that I'm going to be getting to a little bit later in the build. And so, even though there were a lot of different dynastic rulers of Egypt, all of whom came from vastly different backgrounds, I wanted to try to find something that was more proper to Egypt itself. Obviously, this build focuses on the Ayyubids, who were Kurdish, as I mentioned, but even that doesn't feel truly Egyptian in nature. Uh, and the Ayyubids, though Kurdish in origin, were a distinctly Egyptian dynasty for the entirety of their century-odd long reign. The, the other issue with the name Egyptian is that a lot of people hear Egyptian and they think ancient Egypt. And that's obviously not what we're trying to go with here. It's a very deeply entrenched association. And in fact, the largely Islamic, largely Arabic populace of Egypt during the Middle Ages had a deep fascination with Pharaonic Egypt and did an awful lot to try to entwine their cultures together, as I'll touch upon a little bit later. Suffice to say for now that there were state-sponsored tomb raids and a lot of mosques were built into Egyptian ruins. Very, very fascinating. And it shows that even the medieval Egyptians wanted to draw kinship to the famous and venerable ancient Egyptians upon whose bones they were building. Indeed, great queen Cleopatra, who is more seen as a sex symbol in the European West, was considered more of a Plato-esque philosopher queen among the Egyptian Muslims, the sort of person who is this unparalleled paragon of virtue and wisdom, which I found fascinating, and once again shows a deep desire to be Egyptian among the many Islamic peoples who immigrated into Egypt during the Middle Ages, be they Arabs or Kurds or Turks or whatever else. So 
To conclude my sidebar, the name Egyptians doesn't feel quite right to me, though I do think it is the best I have as of now. If you have any suggestions on what I might turn the name into instead, I would love to hear your thoughts down in the comment section below. And with that sidebar now behind us, let's move on to the history section, the history of medieval Egypt. Now, Egypt as a civilization is mostly relevant on the world stage post-1000 AD, but of course plenty of things were happening there beforehand. It's not like they just didn't exist. The Byzantines had a very firm hold over Egypt during the beginning of the AOE II relevant time frame. But once the Rashidun Caliphate, the first great Islamic empire, rose in Saudi Arabia, they very quickly got rid of the Byzantines who retreated back north and happily colonized Egypt as the first new Islamic protectorate, effectively. Not long after, when the Umayyads came to power among the Islamic peoples, they kicked the Rashidans out of Egypt and set up Egypt as pretty much their second base of operations outside of Syria. And so it became even more a fixture of their imperial ambitions during this time as well. If you'd like to see my build on the Umayyads, recently renamed the Syrians, a link to the video is available up here right now. Now, eventually, the jizya tax that the Umayyads tried to impose on the local Christian Coptic peoples of Egypt caused them to get angry and support an Abbasid takeover of Egypt, which, let's be honest, was pretty much inevitable. The Abbasids were gaining power for a while at that point, and the Umayyads were losing hold fast. So the Abbasids were welcomed into Egypt, largely speaking, and promptly imposed a fairly similar reign that the Umayyads had at first. Eventually, however, Egypt became somewhat autonomous, with Coptic Christians in Egypt having a lot more rights than they had pretty much since the reign of the Byzantines. Uh, by 868-ish AD, Egypt could even kind of call itself a nation. Uh, however, they got a bit too big for their britches and were reconquered by the Abbasids shortly thereafter. Now, all this was to change when the Shia Fatimids invaded from Tunisia in the 900s. AD. Shias and Sunnis obviously don't get along, and the Fatimids had been ruling North Africa for quite some time, with Egypt as the obvious next target for them before they tried to move on and retake the Middle East from their Sunni adversaries. The Abbasids were kicked out, the Fatimids installed themselves. And kind of like the Umayyads had centuries before, the Fatimids almost shifted the primary base of their operations to Egypt during this time. Now, my build does not focus heavily on the Fatimids because they were very, very different from a lot of the more Sunni Islamic dynasties that would come thereafter, but still, they were a very important fixture of the region during this time and comfortably ruled Egypt for a couple hundred years. Now, during this entire period, Egypt was not Egypt as we know it geopolitically now. It actually encapsulated a good amount of what is now Syria too. This was a remnant of the former Umayyad dynasty's harmonization of those two areas as their regnal base of power. And so the Shia Fatimids did control Syria and a bunch of the interstitial area between the two countries during this time. However, when the Seljuks came riding in from the steppe, they completely smashed the former Syrian holdings, causing Fatimid power to also withdraw from that area. Not too long thereafter, the First Crusade comes washing through the entirety of the Middle East, and of course there would be a great many to follow. Egypt, especially North Egypt, would be a major juicy target for just about every crusade that was launched from Europe during this entire period, and so you can just assume that from any, everywhere from like 1096 AD all the way up until like the 1200s, there is a crusade going on somewhere in Egypt at almost any given point. Look who's on camera. Do you want to say something? Yeah, it's you. It's you. He's not the Byzantine. So, in summary, suffice to say that despite the various incursions of all sorts of invading peoples, the Fatimids had a pretty tight control over Egypt for a good couple hundred years all the way up until the Ayyubid dynasty is founded. Salah ad-Din, you may have heard of him before, he's kind of a big deal, was the founder of this dynasty, in the process booting the Fatimids firmly out of Egypt and going on a massive conquest run that expanded Egypt's territory to levels that even rivaled Egypt at its height during the Pharaonic 
periods. Saladin is probably the single most important person in all of Egyptian medieval history, and it's for good reason. He did everything. And in the process, he brought Egypt into close contact with a whole bunch of other local neighbors, like the Georgians and the Persians up north, and then the Ethiopians, Mose, and other African peoples down south. The Ayyubids even had such great influence that he recruited levies from pretty much all of these people, as well as exacting tribute and partaking in trade. 1171 until Saladin's death and I think 1200 something was the golden era of the Ayyubid dynasty and for medieval Egypt as a whole. But that wouldn't last for long. After Saladin died, Egypt didn't have a lot of fantastic leaders, and the Ayyubids quickly fell apart. They didn't even make it to a century. I was wrong when I said that earlier. Instead, being unseated by the commanders of their elite Turco-Mongolic crack troops, the Mamluks. The commanders of the Mamluks became the first leaders of the eventual Mamluk Caliphate, uh, a very fraught empire that would last much longer than the Ayyubid dynasty, but not quite have its high highs. The Mamluks at first had very strong leadership, but after a while it just kind of devolved into various Turkic clans infighting for command over the region, and even though they technically still controlled a pretty substantial empire, they had very little hold over it overall. Though again, there were some exceptions. The Mamluks had a lot of ups and a lot of downs. But the relative disorder that characterized the Mamluk state was not entirely their fault. They had a couple of really, really big problems to deal with. Uh, ever heard of the Mongols? Yeah, they came in during this time. How about Tamerlane? Yeah, he also came in during that time. And both of them caused serious, serious headaches. And by headaches, I mean massive losses of territory and human life. Uh, you know what else causes a massive loss of human life? Plague. The Black Death absolutely eviscerated Egypt during this time. I think it had higher than 25% mortality rate across the entire population. And coming out of that, the Mamluks were reduced to effectively a bunch of warlords that fought each other more than they did surrounding powers and were pretty easy pickings for some of the stronger states that would come rolling in. And you know what really strong state started to roll in towards the end of the AoE2 relevant time frame? Hmm, it starts with an O and ends with a Tamans. Yeah, they, they took over Egypt pretty comfortably without the Mamluks putting up all that much of a fight. And that brings us to the end of the AoE2 relevant time frame. The Ottomans having control of Egypt, along with pretty much everywhere else east of the Balkans. And Egyptian forces were often involved in Ottoman military moves during this time. But where is Egypt now? Well, as you might know from history class, they were occupied largely by the Ottomans, and then after that by the Brits and some others in between, until about 1953, at which point they gained their independence and have been a pretty decent-sized geopolitical power within the Mediterranean. They've obviously gone through plenty of ups and downs and controversies since then, but I think that we can safely say now that while Egypt was born from a great melting pot of different Turkish and Middle Eastern and African and Mediterranean peoples, its current inhabitants fully and unambiguously deserve to be called Egyptians. With all of that complicated history out of the way, let's move on to some of the flavor that I've devised for this Egyptian civilization. Their architecture is Middle Eastern, surprising no one, with unique skins for the archery range, a very important building for this civilization, as well as the castle. Their language, like so many other civilizations during this time frame, was Arabic. Salam, everyone. However, you remember me talking a little bit earlier on how a lot of the elite troops of Egypt during most of its relevant time in the limelight were Kurdish in origin? Well, in my build of the Egyptians, all gold-costing military units will speak Kurdish in this particular build. Slal, everyone. Uh, this should hopefully give the Egyptians a little bit more identity and historicity, as well as helping them stand out just from a unit clickability standpoint. Moving on, the wonder for the Egyptians is the Abu al-Haggag Mosque. Earlier on, I described how Islamic Egypt during the Middle Ages really wanted to have a connection with Pharaonic Egypt. And one of the many ways they did this was by constructing mosques in Egyptian ruins. Abu al-Haggag Mosque is one such example, and in my opinion is one of the most beautiful ones. And as I'm sure my picture for it shows, has a really gorgeous blend of styles that I think really adds a nice dash of flavor to the Egyptian civilization, and is how I'd love to see other buildings of theirs kind of looking to help them stand out from other Middle Eastern civilizations. Now, let's move on to campaigns. Before anything else, you gotta talk about Salah ad-Din, uh, or Saladin as we know him. 
Um, you pretty much have to have Saladin as the Egyptian campaign protagonist. The current Saladin campaign could quite easily be ported to my current Egyptian's build uh, and would play just fine, or you could make an entirely new campaign. Though the current Saladin campaign is such a crowd pleaser, I don't think people would want to change it. So let's assume Saladin is the campaign protagonist. What other Egyptian campaigns could we come up with in addition to him? Well, I have two main contenders. The first of which is his brother, Al-Adil I. Now, Al-Adil was kind of a power behind the throne during Saladin's time. He was known for being very wily and diplomatic, and when Saladin died and his three sons started squabbling over his kingdom, Al-Adil kind of puppeted them against each other, and not only did he end up gaining power, he gained control over the entire Ayyubid dynasty, but had enough support from the common people, nobles, and commanders that he was able to pull it off. His reign was characterized by all sorts of crusades and fights with other Arabic factions and all sorts of other nonsense, and so there'd still be plenty of interesting stuff to do, even beyond just wrangling the battle between Saladin's sons, so I think there's enough for variety and uniqueness to his campaign in comparison to the current Saladin campaign that they could pair pretty nicely together. Now the other one I like even more. The first and I believe only female official ruler of an Islamic country, Shajar al-Dur. Now Shajar was one of the last ever Ayyubid rulers. While at first she was a power behind the throne during the latter days of the Ayyubid dynasty, she is credited as rallying the defense against a major crusade led by Francis Louis IX and drove the crusaders out of Cairo with the people at her back. So she was absolutely beloved and even crowned Sultana of Egypt. She wasn't recognized by the Abbasids, however, and so instead she decided to marry the Mamluk leader Ibek after he killed off the last dynastic Ayyubid. Um, and she was very well liked during this time, with many Egyptians calling her queen instead of recognizing Ibek and his Mamluks as the official rulers of the country. Now, this eventually devolved. Ibek wanted to take another wife, Shah Jar said, over my dead body, and he had her beaten to death by a mob of slaves. But her tomb in Egypt is still visible today. And from what I could find, she is still held up as an icon of the country. In summary, a very interesting female protagonist with a lot of very interesting story beats and plot points available as scenarios, I think she would be fantastic. Now, beyond the campaigns that could star the Ayyubids, there are a couple existing ones that they could, of course, appear in. Besides Saladin, obviously. The first one being Barbarossa VI. That scenario actually features Saladin as well, so he could easily be subbed in to be playing the Egyptians. Additionally, in Tamerlane V, you fight the Mamluks, which this build of the Egyptians can also cover. And in Edward Longshanks number 2, you fight a couple of Middle Eastern factions, among whom I think the Egyptians are a, again, very, very acceptable. And so there are no shortage of places where the Egyptian civilization could fit into Age of Empires II as it stands now, without even taking away that much ground from the Abbasid dynasty, namely what I plan on porting the rest of the current Saracen civilization primarily into. Before we conclude with the history and flavor section, let's end off with a couple of major themes. Topics that kept arising during my study of Egyptian history that I thought could serve as cornerstones in a design for them as a civilization. The first was that Egypt has always been a cultural hub. Not only does trade pass through it all the damn time, but under the high points of the Ayyubid dynasty, madrasas, which are like mosques slash universities, were built everywhere by Salah al-Din, bringing the overall education level dramatically up within the country. They also, of course, have their connections that they tried to establish to older ancient Egypt, which again speaks to a level of cultural depth that a lot of other civilizations during this time weren't really trying to establish. Now, second thing I found was their elite military class. This obviously is most famously exemplified under the Mamluks, but was present in many of the other dynasties that ruled Egypt before them. These were usually foreign-born men, impeccably trained, professional soldiers. In fact, one of the first paid standing armies in history was Egyptian. And because of these things, not only did Egypt not normally have to conscript as many levies in war, but they were able to dominate many battlefields, except when they were taken off guard or were dramatically outnumbered. Uh, lastly, Egypt was trading hands perpetually through its entire medieval history. It was conquered like five times, and there's probably a bunch more that I didn't even mention in the history section. And because of this, as well as the cultural hub thing, there are so many cultural and ethnic influences in the country that it was very difficult to encapsulate them all in a single build. 
Regardless, it shows again not only a level of cultural depth many other medieval civilizations didn't reach, but it places them very definitively as the crossroads of the medieval Islamic world. And with that, we come to the end of the history and flavor section. Thank you so much for watching. If this was all you were here for, please remember to like and subscribe before you tap out. For all those of you who, like me, enjoy Age of Empires and want to see what I did with this civilization, let's move on to the game mechanics. Firstly, an overview. The Egyptians are an archer and elite civilization. I use this tag elite in a couple of my other builds, like the Georgians and the Romans, and it pretty much designates military units that cost gold. So your knight line, your archer line, not including siege. So the first of the Egyptian bonuses that I have here is that their archers deal bonus damage, scaling age by age, to units within two range. Archers are not known necessarily for their effectiveness at close range, but this bonus really incentivizes you to do so, and it applies to their entire archery range, including units like the Skirmisher. Now, how did I come to this? Well, Egyptians, especially the Mamluks and the Kurdish elite who came before them, were famed for their shock cavalry archer tactics, where they would ride right on top of an enemy and shoot at him point-blank range. This didn't just apply to the battlefield, however. A lot of their city defense circumstances involved them shooting incredibly heavy arrows at close range at assaulters trying to scale walls, to the point where a number of Crusader accounts talked scathingly about these weapons and how terrifying they were, and cautioned their allies to try to stay at a bit of a range before trying to sprint in before these heavy arrows could pierce through their defenses. The Egyptians' second bonus is a direct port of the market bonus from the current Saracens. Commodity trading fee reduced by 25%. I've talked at length about how Egypt was a cultural and trading hub, and this is pretty much meant to represent exactly that, while also being a familiar touchstone for a lot of the players who are used to the Saracens as a civilization. This is my personal favorite of all of the Saracens' mechanics, and I really wanted to see it included. Third bonus, eco-buildings and units cannot be attacked for the first 20 minutes of the game. All your villagers, all your houses, town center, farms, note that it doesn't apply to things like towers, walls, and military production buildings. As I mentioned, Egypt was trading hands constantly during the Middle Ages, but you may notice that it came out of many of these exchanges intact. Egypt was seen as such a venerable land full of wealth and culture that even incoming crusaders were fairly reluctant to just torch it indiscriminately. Additionally, many Egyptian leaders, including many of the Mamluks, the Ayyubids, and even the Fatimids before them, during weak points during their various dynasties, were forced to use diplomacy rather than brute strength to negotiate with much more powerful neighbors. And so I tried to represent all these pieces together as an early game treaty bonus that prevents your opponent from hurting you very badly unless you're also trying to make use of aggressive play. Fourth bonus. Relics can be garrisoned inside of universities, not providing a gold trickle, but instead each reducing the cost and research time of all technologies that you have, all of them, in any building, by 10% each. Now, this obviously is similar to the Chinese bonus, but it requires you to get relics. The payoff, though, is immense, even allowing you to do things like age up to Imperial for pennies if you actually manage to pull off your relic play correctly. This will incentivize the Egyptians to make a lot of map control plays once they hit Castle Age, instead of just coming out of their treaty in a solely turtling position, trying to give them a couple of different playstyle options that they can mix and match together as desired. Lastly, their team bonus, again aping the current Saracens, but shuffled to affect all players on your team, is that markets cost minus 100 wood. I felt like it was a good way to reference how many people really wanted to trade and route their goods through Egypt. And in practice, it should make it a lot easier for you and your opponent to throw out quick trade lines a little bit earlier than you might otherwise have been able to do, as well as giving you utility earlier in the game when you're just trying to trade before the markets crash. Let's move on from here to their unique units, because they have two. The first, their castle unique unit, is called the Abtal. This is a heavily armored crossbowman. He costs more wood and gold than a normal archer line would, and he's quite slow with a fairly low rate of fire. His range is also a little bit less than an equivalent crossbowman, but he is very tanky. The way I would pitch him is imagine if a Teutonic Knight were an archer and were less indexed towards melee armor. So his HP is high, 
Both of his armor stats are great, but he is very, very slow. He also has distinctly better damage than other archers, and has an attack bonus versus levy units, namely those that don't cost any gold. So even though he can't attack very often, when he does, it will pack a bunch. Lastly, the Abtal gains additional benefit from the Egyptian's archer damage civilization bonus, making him do even higher damage to units that are actually trying to kill him in close quarters, and encouraging what I hope will be a very interesting style of play with your Abtal, where you're actually trying to close the distance with your slow speed if your enemy isn't coming to you immediately. Not only do I think this unit matches up quite well with Egyptian military history, they did tend to have very heavily armored units, including archers, and made great use of the crossbow, but we also need more archer unique units in the game, and I think the Abtal is a pretty good way to do something different with the tried and true archer formula in AoE 2. Now, second of all, the Egyptians also have access to a stable unit called the Mamluk. It looks very different from the Mamluks we know now in the game. In fact, it replaces your knight line altogether. It's a little bit cheaper than a knight as well, but it is overall a little bit weaker. It's quicker, uh, slower to train, and even has a small attack bonus versus cavalry. But the thing most unique about the Mamluk is when you task it to attack someone, it will shoot at them with a bow as it is charging into combat. Once it gets on top of them, it'll go to its spear. While it is charging, it actually benefits from your archer bonus damage, making it very, very good at killing enemies who are retreating from it if it can stay close behind them. They benefit from all archer attack technologies and Parthian tactics while they're using this effect, and Parthian tactics even gives them bonus armor regardless of which form they are in, though normally they would benefit from standard cavalry armor upgrades. In summary, it's a unit that is trickier to use than the knight and requires a bit more micro, but has a much higher payoff ceiling if you can make good use of it, and can get just as tanky later on, because while its armor doesn't scale as well as the knight, Parthian tactics will bring that armor up to snuff with the other standard heavy cavalry options. Just like the knight upgrades into the cavalier and the paladin, the mamluk upgrades into the royal mamluk in imperial age, and then the kasakia later in imperial age. Once you have fully upgraded kasakia in post-imperial age, they are going to be doing an awful lot of work and will overall feel, I'm guessing, better to use than a paladin normally would. Lastly, let's touch upon the unique technologies. Their castle age technology is called Ikta. This makes it so that your military production buildings, all of them, cost much less to build and research all technologies twice as fast. Not only will this make it much easier to leverage a very large army post-imperial with a ton of production buildings all spamming at once, but it will also make tech switches much easier late game as the Egyptians. Since your technologies are researched so much faster and your buildings are so much cheaper, it'll be a lot easier to, for example, throw up a couple of stables if you've been focusing archers all castle age long and get to those powerful late game cavalry upgrades before your opponent expects you'll be able to do so. For Imperial Age, on the other hand, the Egyptians have Furusia. This technology referencing the almost code of chivalry that Egyptian Mamluks followed gives all archers and cavalry units bonus HP equal to 20% of their gold cost. This makes it so that units like the Mamluk and Kasakia gain plus 15 HP, while units like the Abtal gain plus 12. It's a very comprehensive bonus that will make your two major unit types do a lot more work than they could normally be expected to, and though it is fairly expensive, it will bring your late game army compositions to a point where they become very, very difficult to penetrate if you are playing your cards right. As always, if you'd like to see any of the further, more expanded details on these bonuses, these units, these technologies, and anything else, check out my Civilization doc down in the description below. Let's move on to their tech tree. Spirit of the Lost style, as has become tradition. Let's begin with their infantry. The Egyptians have a C- for infantry. They do have champion, they do have plate mail armor, but they're lacking halberdier, supplies, and arson. Infantry do somewhat benefit from the Ikta technology, and it will be a lot easier to, for example, pivot into champions if your opponent is spamming eagle warriors because of that technology, but it's not something you will almost ever be doing as Egyptians in comparison to your other stronger options. Nextly, archers. They got an A for the archery range, ladies and gentlemen. They have the Abtal, they have Furusia, their unique technology, and they have a literally perfect tech tree for the entire archery range, as well as their close-up damage bonus, which, while it wouldn't be nearly as strong as just a flat increase to damage, will still make a lot of difference, both for certain units and if you tailor your strategy around the bonus. Cavalry is also very, very strong for the Egyptians. They have an A-. Furusia again comes in strong, and their Mameluk unit should bring a lot of different options to the table. 
Not to mention that, they have a perfect tech tree. They're lacking the knight, but that doesn't count. The Mamluk replaces it. And so overall, as the Egyptians, you have tons of options when playing with cavalry, and the only thing holding them off of an A flat out is they don't have a committed bonus of any kind for them. Next, Siege. A B for Siege. You have a lot of different good options, including Siege Engineers. You don't have Siege Ram, which kind of sucks, and of course your Siege don't benefit explicitly from any of your bonuses, but just having Siege Engineers, Bombard Cannon, and Siege Onagers together makes it more than fitting for a B. In fact, I might even up this to a B+. Tell me what you guys think. Defenses. It's another strength for the Ayubids. It's a B+. They're missing Arrow Slits. Oh no! Oh no, they're missing Bombard Tower. But they have that awesome treaty bonus, and that by itself will shore up your otherwise shaky early game to the point where you should be able to power through to the mid game if you don't rely too heavily on it. And besides those two technologies, they have a literally perfect university. Nextly, their economy. It's a D. It's, it's a D plus, in fact. It's definitely the weakest part of the civilization overall. Yes, market play is good. There's no doubt about that. And yes, Ikta is pretty helpful, but not only is the market fairly hard to use, but you are missing three useful late game eco technologies. Lacking crop rotation and two man saw alone is crippling for many civilizations. And because of this, the Egyptians are absolutely a quality over quantity civilization. Your units are excellent, but it can be hard to support them because the economy behind it is so shaky and so reliant on the market. Though I will say, I anticipate the Egyptians being very good in team games, where their gold reliance isn't as much of a problem, and where late game eco can be shored up a lot by attributing and by trade lines. Next, Dock. It's a B minus. They don't have ship rate, but otherwise it's unremarkable. Not having an early game bonus does also hurt the Dock a good amount, though I guess you could say the market is useful for Dock play at times, but overall, I didn't think it merited anything higher than this. And lastly, Monks. It's a B plus for the Monastery. They don't have Heresy, but otherwise they have a complete tech tree, and they have that nice Relic bonus. While you're not putting the Relics in Monasteries, you're still very incentivized to get them. Not only that, but a strong market helps out Monks way more than almost any other strategy. So in summary, while they don't have any explicit bonuses for the Monastery, I still think a B plus is very much merited. And with that analysis of their tech tree out of the way, let's move on to their playstyle. How do I think the Egyptians would actually go about playing in-game on average? I had a guess. Well, here's what I got for you for now. In the early game, the Egyptians do have access to all the rushes in the game. Their archers are actually very good, because if you can get enemies close, which will often happen in feudal rushes, you get plus one damage. And plus one damage is a big deal in feudal age. Um, for the most part, though, you're probably going to want to capitalize on your treaty bonus early on. You don't have any economy bonuses, and besides your archer damage, your military doesn't really get strong till later on. So for the most part, I anticipate most people trying to wall up using houses, which can't be broken under the treaty bonus unlike walls, in order to try to get as much of an eco foothold as they can before their enemy is allowed to attack whatever they want. I should note, by the way, that the treaty bonus counts in-game minutes rather than out-of-game minutes, and so 20, while it might sound like a lot, is not really that much. It is pretty hard for most players to consistently reach Castle Age before 20 minutes, and especially since your opponent will be able to do pretty much whatever they want during that time as well, since you can't really build military units if you want to capitalize on the treaty, it's going to be difficult to turn that early advantage into any sort of traction late game, because your opponent will have a lot of the map control if you just turtle up in your base for this entire period. And like I said earlier, you're wanting to get relics as the Egyptians. So if you rely too hard on the treaty, you're going to miss out on an entire other one of your bonuses, which could be even more impactful than this going into late game. Now, once you hit the mid game as the Egyptians, you really start to have some great options. Your crossbows are fantastic, your Mamluks have a lot of potential and can be really, really good raiders while also still holding their own as heavy cavalry, and you also have market into Monk and Siege Push, much like the Saracens do now. In fact, I think you can almost exactly execute the same strategy using this build. Besides that, having relics in your university is going to really help out your weak economy, so if you do a market Monk thing, especially on maps like Arena, you're going to be paid off for it big time late game. And speaking of late game, the Egyptians love late game. Their elite units are so dominant and will absolutely smash the vast majority of enemy armies on the field. They have their fully upgraded Mameluk line, the Kasakia, they have elite Abtals, Arbalesters, Heavy Camels, they have tons and tons of really strong gold options. 
but once gold runs out, they're gonna have a few problems. Their siege is also quite serviceable, as I showed earlier, and so it's not like you'll just be able to do archers and cavalry. You, you can back that up with some serious oomph to break into your opponent's base. And while you are really good at teching into units with Ikta where you need to, the main problem with the Egyptian late game is their economy once again. You're missing those important technologies, and you have such a massive emphasis on gold units that it will be quite easy to dry up and fizzle out once the map starts to get depleted of that critical resource in 1v1s. I think that's a pretty serviceable summary of the Egyptian playstyle, so let's move on to a couple of loose threads before we wrap up the build, starting, as always, with some uncertainties, some lingering questions that didn't quite get resolved for me as I was designing this civilization. First of all is the treaty bonus. I, I anticipate a lot of people really disliking this one. Um, people don't like being told they can't attack something, and while there are ways to kind of get around the treaty bonus, like for example just parking things in your opponent's base, I'm feeling like this won't be too bad in practice, but you guys are very good at picking out things that I missed. Uh, second of all, the old Mameluk is one of the most brain-meltingly stupid and ahistorical units in the entire game but it is a fan favorite. M my proposal is even though I tried to make my version of the Mameluk a lot more realistic and still having a really cool varied playstyle, it even has a ranged attack, guys. I, I really tried. Um, my proposal is that the old Mameluk model be used for a lot of Egyptian heroes in campaigns and stuff like that. So you still can have the scimitar lobbing camel numpty if you really want him. But since my builds focus so much on historical authenticity, I really couldn't in good conscience keep the scimitar guy, guys. I'm, I'm sorry if you don't like it, but I'm firm on this one. Uh, lastly, I strongly considered creating a Ghulam regional unit. It would look totally different from what the Hindustanis have now, but Ghulams were present everywhere across the medieval Islamic empires, and they had a really interesting niche. The, the Mamluks were effectively a, a subdivision of the Ghulams, like a type of Ghulam. And so I thought it could be cool to kind of unify the Islamic powers by giving them this shared Ghulam regional unit. I never really crystallized exactly what its role would be, but it's something I might revisit in future. So don't be too surprised if you see something like this popping up on a future Islamic build. And if you have ideas for what a regional Ghulam could look like, please let me know down in the comments. I'd definitely like to hear your thoughts. On to some table ideas. Some stuff that didn't make the build, but I strongly considered. Uh, one, the archer bonus also affects defensive buildings. Unfortunately, defensive buildings very often shoot at things right at their base, and I thought it would be too strong. Not to mention pushing the Egyptians a little too far towards a turtley playstyle. The treaty bonus already does that enough, you know what I mean? Uh, second of all, make the Abtal mounted, like a, a mounted heavy crossbowman, or rename it to the Thakla. Uh, the current name Abtal effectively just means like heavily armored vanguard. Uh, the sources that I found it in didn't really specify what exactly they did, so I kind of consolidated it with like the armored archer stuff I also knew was going on and just kind of stole the name. Thakla is actually a lot more like technically accurate to what the Abtal is trying to do, like a, a dismounted heavily armored infantryman often wielding a crossbow. Um, but it was a ni less nice word than Abtal, in my opinion, and I felt like Abtal kind of fit as well. Third of all, um, the technology Ikta. At one point, I had making unit upgrades cheaper, as well as making it so that if you fully upgraded a unit, all technologies, including blacksmith, that unit became cheaper as well. Um, this felt a little too swingy in late game, and I didn't want to give the Egyptians too many discounts because their soldiers are so powerful. Uh, but it was an interesting idea for sure. The term Ikta refers to like rewards of land given to successful military veterans. And so I, I knew it had to have something to do with like buildings and unit seniority. But I, I think I like what I came to more than I like this. Uh, next, on the topic of unique technologies, Furusia at one point gave all archers and cavalry a charge attack or hit point regeneration. Both of these kind of worked with the whole kind of code of chivalry thing. Furusia more broadly wasn't just about how you behave yourself. It was like manuals, extensive manuals on how to shoot, how to shoot from horseback, how to ride horses, all these different instructions for fighting and behavior and military tactics. It was really, really interesting. And so there's a lot of things that technology could do. HP felt the simplest and cleanest and still felt quite fitting to me, like improving one's constitution and, and morale as a soldier, um, even more than giving them special, unique capacities on the battlefield. Um, would love to hear your thoughts. I'm, I'm, I'm flexible on this one. Uh, another one. Uh, the archer line at one point gained bonus armor or even just bonus attack um, or even bonus accuracy. I, I knew I wanted to give them an archer bonus and I knew I wanted them to be an archer civilization because we have so damn few of them. Um, and this was a rare opportunity to get like a really historically grounded one added to the game. 
Um, but I really like the Archer bonus I came to. I think it's very, very unique, though I would be definitely willing to update it if it just proved completely untenable in practice. Archer armor could be quite interesting. Uh, Rick click, Jesus. Wow, that's a typo. So you can, another idea, you can Rick click a monk onto a building to speed the research of that building. This is another kind of like madrasa adjacent technology. The relics garrison and university thing I think does this better, but this was an option for sure. It feels kind of AOE for though, so I'm not sure how much people would like it. I like the mechanic though. And last option for bonuses that I didn't end up using was that universities would heal nearby units in like an area of effect. Um, Salah ad set up a good number of hospitals, not to mention madrasas often functioned as hospitals. So this felt cool, thematic, interesting, but just ended up being kind of weak and not as fun as some of the other bonuses I came to. I, I do love healing as a mechanic and I might even table putting a hospital building into one of my builds someday. So we'll, we'll hold out hope for this one yet. Next slide, let's talk about some unique stuff that I didn't use. The Kararia. This would be a very long range archer, kind of like a longbowman, but lower damage. And we have a bonus versus units that just recently came into its line of sight. Because these were like sentrymen, right? Who were trying to pick off enemies that were, were first trying to invade or raid a camp. Uh, and so I thought, what better to have another good long range archer in the game that plays totally differently from a longbowman. You're not just plopping down and shooting constantly. You're trying to like, constantly be maneuvering these guys so that they're newly seeing enemies and getting a bonus against them. But it just felt too complicated and the Abtal felt more cohesive with the identity I ended up going with. Uh, another one, Wutawiya. This would be a, like a, a religious zealot which joined the army um, in order to fight effectively for, for jihad purposes rather than for money. Uh, this would be a, a cheap fodder infantryman from the monastery. Um, I wasn't really sure what more to do with it from there, but the Civ already had two unique units, and this one felt extraneous. Uh, Shujan, this would be a cheap light cavalry with a charge attack bonus that only applied versus infantry. It was like a, a frontline lanceman that would go in, smash the enemy, and pull back in order to weaken their front for more heavy cavalry to push through. Uh, Kuma, this was a, a unique technology. This was a term referring to something called a veiled horseman, which was alluded to in one of my sources exactly, which I can only presume meant like a very heavily armored horseman. And I thought it could be cool to give like a big pierce armor bonus to your cavalrymen. Just ended up not being as cool or versatile of a technology as Furusia. Plus, I didn't want Mamluks to be too good against archers, because as is, they're, they're already better against archers than normal knights are, because they can shoot. Uh, Nextly, another unique technology. I had a lot of unique options for this civilization that I didn't use. This is Jund Mizir. Uh, this was a, uh, a reserve force specifically for the protection of Cairo. It would make it such that units train faster based on their gold cost. I really loved playing with gold cost on this civilization. At one point I had like a couple other bonuses that were also based in gold cost, but pairing it back to Furusia seemed a little more wise since I didn't want to index them too much into this one gimmick. Um, and then Arbab al Saif. Uh, this was a term referring to how a lot of Mamluk lords during the Mamluk Empire's reign were kind of appointed based on their military knowledge rather than their economic or political knowledge. Um, and this would make it such that your castle can train Mamluks and it would boost Mamluk attack while within the line of sight of a castle. So kind of the reverse of something like anarchy, but since that's a lot less useful than making the unit trainable at a bunch of standard buildings, it also would give the Mamluk a bonus when they're fighting near a castle. Um, I'd say of all of the things I didn't go with, this is the one I liked the most. And if you think it's better than, for example, Ikta, I could definitely be convinced to add this to the civilization in my next recraft video. But with all that being said, I think it's time to come to the end of this Egyptian build. Thank you all so much for watching. Thank you very much to Ahmed Noor, who recommended this build to me in the first place. You sent me down a really fun rabbit hole of research, my friend, and I hope you feel that I have done the Egyptians justice. Before we end, let's take a look at the old likelyometer. In my opinion, on a scale of 1 to 10, how likely is it that the Egyptians or a civilization very much like them, and like my build you see here today, could be added to AoE2 in the future? And on the likelyometer, the Egyptians score... A 7 out of 10. I actually think that a subdivision of the current Saracens is fairly likely in the not terribly distant future. I don't think it will be the next expansion. I don't think it will be within the next three. But within the next four to six, then we're talking. I think giving them the Dynasties of India treatment is a shoe in Even the name Saracen is dumb and wrong. Uh, and I think that if they are subdivided, the Egyptians are quite likely, I'd say even more likely than something like the Syrians, 
to make it in as one of the many peoples that the current Saracens are broken up into. But that's just what I think. I want to hear what you guys think. How do you like my build? What would you have done differently? And what topics would you like to see me tackle on the channel in future? There are a lot of open questions for this build, so if you have thoughts on any of them, please do share them down below. And don't forget to check out the civilization document linked in the description if you want to see any of the more specific details on this build. But with all that being said, my name is Robbie Howell. And ciao for now, everyone.